Hello everyone, my name is Julian Garcia and I am a speech pathologist with DHR Health. I've been practicing as a speech pathologist for 13 years. Uh, if those of you have some interest in the background of how you become a speech pathologist, it takes around six years. You need two years of undergraduate education, two years of a, a program for speech pathology undergraduate, and then you get a master's degree in speech pathology. Um, as a speech pathologist, or an SOP for short, you can work in a variety of settings. I am a medical SOP, and as a medical SOP, you can work in a skilled nursing facility, a um, hospital, a um, nursing home as well. So today, what I'm going to talk about is what an SOP does, and to make it more current, I am also going to try to add in what an SOP or some of the changes that are going on due to the current pandemic of COVID-19. So a speech pathologist in our most general form, we're specialists in treating and rehabilitating um, communication deficits, swallowing deficits, and voice deficits. So communication is life. Many people do not uh, appreciate the ability that we have to communicate until it is lost. From having one's basic needs met to nurturing relationships and earning a living, communication is the core and really a strong foundation to life. So a lot of individuals can lose their communication through a variety of ways, whether it be through an accident or having a stroke. One thing that we work with initially is called aphasia. And what aphasia is, it's loss of language. And we're going to take a little look at this slide here of the brain. So what aphasia is, again, is loss of language. And there's different parts of the brain that are really important for language functions. If you're looking here at the slide, in the front part we have an area that's marked Broca's area. That area is key for your ability to produce speech. So say if someone has a stroke and that area is impacted, they're not going to be able to effect, uh, effectively express themselves. In the back part, if you look over there, there uh, it's called the Wernicke's area. It's highlighted in blue under comprehension. That area is really important for comprehension. So if that area is impacted, then someone's going to have uh, difficulties understanding language, understanding commands. And there's little pieces and areas that all communicate with one another. So due to a stroke, if any parts are affected there, someone's going to have difficulties communicating. And as a speech pathologist, what we do is we, we uh, teach them strategies and also use evidence-based practice. What that is is research has been done on specific strategies to try to re rehabilitate these issues that have been lost. A different topic or issue that someone might have problems with is cognitive communication disorders. Um, the front part of our brain, the frontal lobe of our brain, is very important for uh, who we are as personality, our attention, our concentration, our processing speed. So progressive diseases, accidents such as a motor vehicle accident, leading to a brain injury or stroke can affect our areas of, of comprehension, I'm sorry, of memory and um, our ability to attend to things. So as a speech pathologist, we work on improving those functions through drills, trying to strengthen the, the network of neurons so that way a patient can regain their functions. Or we also teach them compensatory strategies in which they can try to navigate the issues they might be having. For example, we might teach them how to set alarms on a cell phone, use a calendar for reminders so that way they can remind, uh, remember to take their pills and other activities that they might need to get completed during the day. We're going to talk about two quick motor speech disorders. Apraxia of speech, that is a motor programming disorder. So someone who has had damage to some of the key nerves that we use for speech um, will have difficulty getting out what they want to say. For example, maybe they just want to tell you, I need to go to the restroom. They can think that in their head, but they're not able to get those actual words out to communicate. They might seem like they're groping and trying to uh, move their tongues, but those particular words that they want to say don't come out. One other one is called dysarthria. And what dysarthria is, it's pretty much weakness in the muscles that we use to speak. Um, these people might sound like they're slurred or intoxicated. So as a speech pathologist, we would do strengthening exercises to help 
improve these muscles that we use for communication and speech to get them to be a little more fluid when they speak. What I wanted to touch upon back on language to go back with uh, what's going on with COVID-19, a lot of these patients that are more severe uh, are having to be on a ventilator. So these patients cannot communicate for themselves at the moment, they can't talk. So as a speech pathologist, what we actually do, I did not bring one today, is we go in and we provide these patients with a communication board. So what a communication board in its most general form is kind of a piece of paper that has different pictures on it or functional words that individuals can utilize and point to to express their basic wants and needs. So let's say if they are in pain, there's a specific um, icon that they could point in for that. Or let's say that they are wanting to speak to their family, or not, I'm sorry, contact their family, then uh, they could point to something like that. We're gonna go on to talk about voice and swallowing disorders and I'll also highlight uh, COVID-19 issues here. So as a speech pathologist, we also work with voice disorders. And what a voice disorder is, it's anything that could affect someone's pitch or their loudness or ability to use their voice functionally. And there's three subsystems that we work on there. That would be your respiration. So breathing is really important for being able to speak. Then we have uh, phonation, which is the movement of our vocal folds. That's what most people associate with voice. And then we also have resonance. And resonance is how we actually shape the sounds in our vocal tract. Some people might talk kind of like Rocky, holding the, the um, voice in their throat. Some people talk a little nasal and they might let some come out of their nose. And all of that's normal within reason. If someone has a voice disorder, they've usually had trauma to their vocal folds or they have growths growing on their vocal folds and it kind of changes their ability to communicate. So relating that to the COVID-19 patients, a lot of those patients are on a ventilator for, I think I saw about a minimum of four days. So they pretty much have a tube that's running down their throat and in between their vocal folds. That causes a lot of trauma to all the tissues that are around there. They're gonna get sore, they're gonna get inflamed. So when these patients become extubated and they actually take the tube out, some of them might not be able to functionally communicate for a while. They're gonna have a little weakness in their voice. There might be sore, it might hurt for them to eat. So that's something to think about. Okay, in order to evaluate voice, we uh, do these techniques called stroboscopy. And what we do is we insert a little tube down someone's throat so that way we can see their vocal folds. There's a little image here. There's a uh, rigid stroboscopy and flexible. So rigid was done through the mouth and it's just a straight tube with a camera on the end and flexible stroboscopy. We stick a long tube down someone's nose to hang out in the back of their throat so we can view their vocal folds. And if it, any of you have never seen vocal folds before, this is what they look like. So there we have someone phonating ah. So you can see their vocal folds coming together. And that's what we usually deem as voice. So those COVID-19 patients around where those white things are, they're coming together. They'll probably be inflamed. They might be a little bleeding after they take the tube out. So it might be hard for them to talk initially. So as a speech pathologist, what we would do is maybe give them a little um, strengthening exercises so they can slowly start rehabilitating their voice. As a speech pathologist, I would like for you guys to see this slide too. As a speech pathologist, we also work on voice restoration. We have a lot of patients who unfortunately have laryngeal cancer that has gotten to a point where they have to have their larynx or their voice box removed. And so what we do for voice restoration is we need to provide them with a new voice. So a lot of patients initially on the left hand of your screen will start with an electric larynx and then we progress to a prosthesis, which you can see on the right side of their screen. And what a prosthesis is, is an actually a little tube, and I'll show it to you right now in a second, that's inserted that allows air to go into your esophagus. And the esophagus is a tube that goes down to your stomach and it allows air to go in there and vibrates, almost sounding like the vibration caused by your vocal folds. 
and so it mimics almost some natural speech. So right now I'm going to show you an electric larynx. Okay, so this little thing is an electric larynx. It makes a buzzing sound when you push a button. And what it does is supposed to take the place of your vocal folds. So our vocal folds come together and they create a buzzing sound that we shape into sounds. So when you use this, it's taking the place of your vocal folds. So you don't need to, as a person who has a larynx, you don't need to phonate or produce voice. You just mouth what you want to say. So what I'm going to say is, hi, how are you? But it's just, really, I'm just doing this. So this is going to provide the buzz. You might not be able to hear it well with my microphone, but we'll try it anyways. So what that actually does is it provides a vibration that you can shape into sounds with your mouth. And I mentioned the little prosthesis. This is this tiny little thing right here. So these people have had a total laryngectomy. They no longer breathe from their mouth. Their actual windpipe is rotated and they breathe out of their neck. So this little prosthesis gets emplaced in their neck and then they cover it up to allow air to go in and then they can speak normally. With the prosthesis, it sounds like a normal voice. The only difference is you can't hitch changes in pitch. So you sound maybe a little bit monotone. The other thing we work with uh, as a speech pathologist is swallowing disorders. And what a swallowing disorder is, is any problem getting food from the mouth to your stomach. So there's different ways that we evaluate that with patients in the hospital. We'll initially go to their bedside We'll provide them food and we'll look for signs and symptoms of what we call aspiration or food going down the wrong way to their lungs. Some signs and symptoms of that would be a coughing, a throat clearing. With these COVID-19 patients who are intubated, initially we don't have to worry about them. They're receiving nutrition via a tube that's placed through their nose and down to their stomach. But once they're extubated, we need to go in and evaluate them just as we would a normal patient, but we would have to don some protective equipment. Uh, one thing to consider with these COVID-19 patients is we have to kind of limit some of the things that we would do with a, a standard patient. The COVID-19 can spread through aerosol, kind of through coughing and sneezing. So we have to limit what we would normally do in an evaluation that would limit those uh, things from happening. So we're trying to keep the virus at bay. Two other formal ways that we evaluate swallowing would be through a modified barium swallow study. And you're going to see this image right here. What it is, is we take an individual to a radiology suite and it's a live x-ray and we coat food in barium. And then we can see exactly how it's going down. So we can see if there's any weakness in muscles, we can see if some food is going down the wrong way. Right now with the pandemic, a lot of these studies aren't getting done because these patients with COVID-19 would have to be taken to the radiology suite. And then after they are used, they would have to be thoroughly cleaned and sanitized. And then I think left aired out for a while for a few hours. So these studies really aren't being done at the moment with COVID-19 patients. So a lot of I guess changes that are going on, clinicians or SOPs are having to rely on just their clinical skills and being able to judge things at bedside instead of being able to use some of the formal techniques we're used to. We have one more thing for evaluation. You can see this little picture here. It's called a fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing or a FEES. And it's kind of similar to what we do to evaluate the voice. So we stick a camera down someone's nose and we watch while people consume different consistencies of food. Um, again, right now, we're not doing this with COVID-19 patients. The viral density or where the virus kind of is at its peak or hangs out in your body was known to be most in the nasal cavity in your throat. So if you can see where the camera goes, it's exactly where the virus likes to hang out. So we're trying to reduce the spread of the virus. So currently we're not doing this procedure. So overall, that kind of sums up what we do as a speech pathologist. Again, we're specialists in treating communication issues, swallowing issues, voice issues. Uh, this month, 
May is Better Speech and Hearing Month, so thank you for being here with me and helping me celebrate. I appreciate your time. Mm -hmm.